If you're close to my age, there are certain animated movies that you probably remember especially fondly from your childhood. The Disney renaissance that pushed the boundaries of quality. The DreamWorks competitors that strive to go more epic in scope. A handful of heartfelt Warner Bros. films focusing on figuring out who you are rather than who people want you to be. And small characters on big journeys to find where they belong in a strange new world. All of these were great, and all of them are well remembered today for good reason. Among these, there was a movie that came from none of the usual sources. A movie that was equal parts dark, whimsical, and even downright existential, despite its cutesy appearance and very bizarre title. A movie that many still consider one of the best animated movies of its era. And that movie is The Brave Little Toaster. Based on a children's book written by Thomas M. Dish and released as a movie in 1987, The Brave Little Toaster told the tale of a bunch of household appliances who went off into the world in search of their master, who they hadn't seen in years. It tackled subjects like consumerism, the folly of always chasing new trends, and even used the discarding of older appliances as an analogy for how humans treat each other when they aren't considered up to certain standards. All of them themes that are as relevant today as they were back then, if not even more so in some cases. While production started at Disney, who did provide the funds, the film was produced at Hyperion Pictures by a smaller group of animators on a tight budget, many of which would later become the cornerstones of Pixar. It was a movie meant to shake things up and show people that those wacky, cutesy cartoon characters could do more than just go on amusing little musical misadventures. So of course Disney then bought the distribution rights and spat out two direct-to-video sequels ten years later, because as we all know, that's just a straight line to success. Yeah, The Brave Little Toaster has sequels, and if you thought the idea of a toaster traveling across the states on an office chair dragged by a vacuum cleaner to basically find God was bizarre, then you have no idea what you're in for. Now, I didn't see these sequels as a kid. I didn't even know they existed until I was already an adult, so I figured I had to check them out, and quite frankly, I would like to go back to blissful ignorance. Not because they're necessarily the worst kids' movies ever or anything, far from it, but because they leave me with such a big feeling of... Why? But, oh well, I can't stall any longer. Let's take a look at the first sequel, The Brave Little Toaster to the Rescue, released in 1997. Or was that 1998? Alright, hold on a second, I'm gonna stall a little bit just to clear this one up. To make it as brief as I can, the two sequels, Brave Little Toaster to the Rescue and Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars, were produced back to back, with the second film, To the Rescue, released in 1997. Everywhere but North America, who got it two years later for God knows what reason. As a result, To the Rescue was released after Ghost to Mars and created decades of confusion in the process. Alright, is everybody caught up? Nobody needs me to repeat any of that? Because if it means I don't have to watch this thing again, I will! Ah, uh, okay, fine. Here we go. It's some time after the first movie, and Rob and his girlfriend Chris are about to graduate from college. Rob is studying to be a veterinarian, while Chris apparently just kind of hangs out because the writers didn't consider her enough of an actual character for her major to matter. That's a good sign. The appliances are mainly kept at the lab, with only lamp being kept at the dorm room. But it's alright, he still has an easy time hanging out with the rest of the gang every day, because apparently he can now outrun a car! In broad daylight! In front of people! This is the same desk lamp that had to ride an office chair that was being dragged around by a vacuum cleaner powered by a car battery, by the way. I guess he's been hitting the gym. Of course, this means we get to meet a bunch of new animal friends that Rob is treating. There's Ratso the rat, Macy the cat with her new kittens, Alberto the chihuahua, Sebastian the rescued lab monkey, and Murkatroyd the spittle snake. Wait, I'm, I'm confused. If your snake is leaking, should you visit the vet or the venerologist? Apparently, they also have a pretty active life whenever Rob isn't around, considering they threw a party and have to spend a whole boring musical sequence cleaning it up. Because, well, the first movie started with a cleanup scene, so why not this one too? Oh, yeah, perfect plan, Toaster. I'm sure he'll never notice. Like I said, Rob is about to graduate, and he needs to put the finishing touches on his 600-page thesis. Only for a power surge and a computer virus outbreak on campus to corrupt this file, making it utterly inaccessible. Not even Eddie Deason here can access it. And as it turns out, Rob, like any remotely sensible, decently computer-savvy college student in the late 90s, did not make a single solitary backup of his thesis. Not one. Not even a printed draft. Nothing. 
And to top all of that, his lab assistant is this sleazeball here named Mac, who definitely won't turn out to be the villain of the movie or anything. So, as I'm sure you can imagine, Rob is a little bit stressed out. In fact, he's so stressed out that he's also kind of forgotten about his and Chris's anniversary, which, to her credit, she seems willing to cut him some slack on. Well, that is until Rob explodes at her for using Kirby the vacuum cleaner to clean up some spilled kitty litter in the lab. I told you before, he doesn't do kitty litter. Don't yell. Oh, I just don't want you to ruin my vacuum. Oh, I see. It's perfectly fine for me to clean up kitty litter, but not your stupid vacuum. Come on, Chris. I've had this vacuum since I was a kid. It means a lot to me. Ignoring for a moment that older vacuum cleaners really can't handle kitty litter, let me see a show of hands here. Uh, how many of you have deep emotional connections to your childhood vacuum? Yeah. I said childhood vacuum, you perverts. Yeah, I'm with you, Kirby. I feel like I'm being force-fed cat shit, too. Anyway, it turns out that Mac has sinister plans. He's going to sell all of Rob's animals right under his nose to some wicked place called... Ugh... Tartarus Labs. Oh, okay, so the big scary animal testing lab is called Tartarus Labs. Oh, Tartarus. You know, like the ancient Greek equivalent of hell, Tartarus. That's like if I made a company and called it Satan Incorporated. Is everyone in this movie just gonna go around and proudly announce how evil they are? <laughs> I'm so bad. I'm a bad troll. Lampy, who has been hanging around in Rob's dorm and knows all about the thesis, quickly tells the others about it. And Sebastian quickly jumps on one of the computers to figure out what's going on, because, uh... Yeah, apparently he can do that. How do you know how to do that? Monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> yep, I'm sure that's exactly what the producers said when these sequels were greenlit. Oh god, it's Mother Brain! Somebody call Captain N! And oh boy, I hope you didn't miss the songs from the first movie too much, because believe me, you won't find anything like them here. Instead, you get a bunch of pig-looking computers with disk drive titties singing a song about the wonders of the internet and how they love to be. Which, I don't even want to imagine how that works, and OH GOD, SOMEBODY STOP THE PRINTER, IT'S EATING BLANKET, HELP THE POOR LAD! Would you believe me if I told you that this is probably the best song in the movie? Thankfully, they quickly fuck right back off into the closet they came from. Just in time for the movie to make a half-assed attempt at recreating the famous air conditioner scene from the first one, when the computer gets infected with a virus. THROUGH THE POWER CORD! TECHNOLOGY! Sebastian does catch a glimpse of the shipping plans, however, and tells the others all about it. They naturally refuse to believe that Rob would do such a thing, not knowing that this is actually Mac's doing. And speaking of Mac, like, I think maybe I was a bit too hard on him before, right? Surely a veterinarian's assistant will have a good motivation for being so cruel to animals. I love money. Da, 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 da. I love money. Do, do. We've got to have money. Actually, he seems to be doing it because he owes money to a loan shark of some kind. A loan shark named Slappy. Slappy? Mac here. Where's my $464? Look, I'll have your money tonight. I swear. Anyway, it's starting to become clear that something funny is going on at the college, and Ratso tells the other appliances about some weird noises he's heard in the basement. So all of the appliances follow him down there, except Kirby who's too big and stays behind to look after the animals. And I gotta say, when Mac comes in, Kirby does a pretty bang up job at just that. <laughs> Man, imagine calling your loan shark and telling him you can't pay him back today because you got your ass kicked by a vacuum cleaner from the 50s. Unfortunately, Mac eventually manages to trap Kirby in the closet and can proceed with his plans unhindered. In the meantime, the appliances and Ratso find the source of the computer virus. An old vacuum tube computer named Wittgenstein who used to be cutting edge, but has now been abandoned in the college basement. How long have you been down here? 4,999,450,852,312 nanoseconds. So, about 80 minutes? Ever since that awful day when... when... When transistors were invented. So, since 1947? Man, you are malfunctioning. I 
glistened and gleamed for a while back, then it seemed I would go on forever in my prime. Oh, good. Now he's getting a song where we can really see him getting eaten from the inside out by disease. Chop and munch, chew and crush. There's a lot here to destroy. Inch by inch, it's a fish. Bringing down this big old boy. Because there was nothing I needed more in this world than hearing Bill Murray's older brother Brian singing a song that's essentially about having Alzheimer's. My memory fades as my circuitry degrades. It gets harder and harder to recall. I was the hope on the horizon, but now I'm realizing I'm a giant who's about to fall. Oh yeah, just listen to those pipes. Why, he's almost as good a singer as the late great Gilbert Gottfried. You know, I just realized something. This is a song being sung by an old man who's slowly marching towards death, thinking back to his glory days and how he's now been discarded because the world considers him useless. That means that this... Chop and munch, chew and crunch, there's a lot here to destroy. ...is this movie's equivalent to worthless. You know, the most famous and heartbreaking song from the original, where all the cars stare death in the face, knowing that no one has cared about them or their accomplishments for years and never will again. Yeah. That worthless. I to come into a graveyard. I beg your pardon, it's quite hard enough to live in with the stuff I have learned. Yeah, those, uh, those are some big shoes to fill. I'm searching, expecting, exploring, connecting, so no. Has to feel their left behind. And you can't. So yeah, Wittgenstein has a virus, and his attempts at warning Rob about Max's plans to sell the animals has resulted in it spreading to the entire school. And all of this is because some genius decided that this discontinued, obsolete tube computer from the 70s that isn't even in use desperately needed to be hooked up to the internet. Sure, whatever, fine. However, the virus is so severe that it's actually shorting out Wittgenstein's tubes. Which is something he's entirely too eager to show off. Wow! Tube City! Makes me all tingly inside! Whoa, whoa, radio! Uh, far be it from me to judge your taste in men, but could you maybe be a little bit less excited about essentially giving an old man a rectal exam? It turns out that Wittgenstein's main power tube, which is the exact same one that radio uses, is about to burn out, and it's pretty rare and hard to replace. Thankfully though, radio and Ratso find one in college storage super easily, only to immediately break it when they get into a fight over who gets to shove a light bulb up a senior citizen's butthole. You know, as you do. This leads to the movie's biggest attempt at drama as everyone gets mad at radio. And then this happens. So radio, any bright ideas? <sighs> okay, look, I kind of get where they're going here. Radio can be an attention whore and a glory hound. And this time those bad qualities got the better of him, and now he and his friends may have to pay the price for it. This all sounds fine. But all it does is add a few minutes to the runtime where Ratso and Radio run around in a storage unit and face no difficulties doing so. Why would you establish that this item is so rare if there's one just readily available a few rooms away, only to then destroy it immediately after? We could have had Radio realizing that his tube is the same kind that Wittgenstein uses, but refusing to give it up because of a very understandable fear of death. Then as the final hour started approaching and Wittgenstein got closer to burning out, he could choose to give it to him anyway. That would create tension, and it would make the sacrifice Radio's own choice, and give it an actual narrative meaning. Here it's just like, ah, fuck, my bad guys, I just really wanted to shove my whole entire self into that old dude's colon. Be right back, I'm gonna take one for the team and remove my own heart now. What a wacky development, am I right? But anyway, plucking in the tube works like a charm. Not only is the virus instantly purged from the entire network, it also immediately repairs all of Wittgenstein's physical damage and burned out tubes, because that's how technology works, I guess. Technology! 
So the situation intensifies. Mac is riding along with a truck driver that picked up the animals for some reason, and Wittgenstein quickly calculates a plan to rescue them. They then go fetch Kirby from the closet, bring a modem along so they can communicate with Wittgenstein, yeah, don't ask how that works, Technology. and get the college security camera to alert everybody. Even Rob gets woken up when Wittgenstein not only recovers his thesis, but also sends him Max shipment plans, prompting him to quickly go fetch Chris. In the words of Ricky Ricardo, you have some splaining to do. And so do you if I'm supposed to believe that a 20-something year old woman in the late 90s just happens to be a big I Love Lucy fan. I don't know, maybe she's studying television and media history or something. It sure would be nice if there was a single line of dialogue in this whole goddamn movie that cared enough about the girl to tell us these things. So you'd think the appliances actually get to save the day or something, right? Well, not really. Because of the bad guy's reckless driving, Murgatroyd's terrarium shatters, and since they didn't actually close the storage window and Rob apparently never defanged Murgatroyd, the snake easily slithers in and fucks with the driver, causing the car to crash. It's a whole ass cacophony of absolute incompetence that just magically happens to work out in the good guy's favor. And just as you start to realize that the movie's title character has contributed absolutely nothing to the entire movie except for giving the occasional pep talk, Toaster manages to hold out a box for like two seconds so someone else can rescue Macy and her kittens. Character redeemed, 10 out of 10 writing, essential to the plot. And, well, that's that. Mac is arrested, Rob gets to give him an earful, all the animals are rescued, and our favorite hoarder gets all his stuff back. Well, except for the radio, who he quickly realizes is missing. But of course, going to the basement, they find both radio and Wittgenstein, and we get our last few loose ends tied up. Rob, Chris, and their nerdy friend Charlie from earlier get the admittedly good idea to convert Wittgenstein to modern circuitry and display him at a science exhibit. Which gets Mr. White and Nerdy over here especially excited. Yeah, boy! Can't you see I'm white and nerdy? Look at me, I'm white and nerdy. So, with Rob's thesis recovered, he makes it to graduation. The news of the theft result in people being eager to adopt the lab animals, and to top it all off, he proposes to his girlfriend. Who responds like this? I'd love to marry you. It'll be so... so domestic. <laughs> wow, Chris! Way to sound excited about getting married. Man, that's like if someone introduced me to their new baby and I went, "Oh, They're very... alive. Even Radio gets rescued in the end, because Chris manages to track down a replacement tube. Which was discontinued. And rare. And expensive. And she did this on a college student budget. Within a few days. Using 1997 standard internet message boards. Yeah, sure, okay, it makes about as much sense as everything else. Like the fact that Radio has apparently seen heaven. Coming this summer, an all new Don Bluth adventure. All appliances go to heaven. Close on a terrible, overly saccharine end credit song, and there you have the ending of The Brave Little Toaster does absolutely nothing for 70 minutes except pick up a fucking box that one time. The end. <sighs> okay. Look, I'm not gonna deny that I've been a little bit hard on this movie. It's not without some good points. For a DTV animated sequel, the animation is overall fine, and there are some occasional moments of sweetness that remind me of the first movie. And honestly, I kind of like the idea of going from appliances to animals. The first movie was about taking a second look at how we treat each other through appliances, so why not spend the next movie interacting with creatures that we know are alive and can emote, just not in the same ways that we do. It's once you add in all this computer virus nonsense that everything starts to fall apart. There's nothing wrong with teaching children of the 90s about the internet, of course, and addressing all the specifics of how computer viruses actually work in real life wouldn't have been feasible or entertaining for a child audience, so there had to be some hand-waving and simplifying. I do understand all of that. This just portrays the internet and viruses as complete magical bullcrap. This virus causes power surges, can destroy machinery, spreads through electrical wires from a computer that was built before there was a real internet, and remains entirely contained within a college campus. And somehow, all damage it causes, digital or physical, just gets magically fixed by replacing a tube. It just stretches things to their thinnest point even for the most barely awake children. And to an adult, it can be hair-pullingly frustrating. Oh, and uh, recovering Rob's thesis also does whatever this is to the other computer. Sort of good. My memory banks are being stroked. And by an expert, I feel something, something happening inside of me, and I can't keep it to myself any longer. Uh, do you need a minute alone or something? 
And I'm not saying that horrific animal testing labs and greedy assholes like Mac don't exist, because they absolutely do. But the antagonist being so one-dimensionally evil that even the fucking Care Bears would have a hard time taking them seriously doesn't exactly do the movie any favors either. It really needed to just pick one of its two themes and stick with it to stay coherent. Add some at best uninspired songs that are just there to fill out the runtime, characters that exist only to be rescued and have the plot only happening because Rob is unforgivably stupid, and you're just sitting there baffled at how such a classic movie could spawn this thing. And the worst part is we're not even done. There's still another movie left to watch, and if you thought the idea of the toaster fighting animal abuses and computer viruses was weird, then get ready, because in the next one, they go to space. And I don't think you're ready for that. I definitely wasn't. Hey folks, thanks for watching. I was gonna cover both movies in one video, but there's just too much crazy stuff to talk about, so join me soon for part two. Until then, if you like what you saw, don't forget to hit the like button and leave a comment. Maybe about some other odd animated movie sequels you remember. As always, special thanks go to Silvermoon Ravenwolf, Pocket Mouse, Andreas Wilsom, Warren Miller, Spatial Paladin, John G. Robertson, The Danish Penguin, John Algets, and Thomas Jensen, as well as everyone else who supports me on Patreon. I really appreciate it, you have no idea. And if you want to support me too, you can find the links to Patreon, Kofi, and TeePublic in the description, along with an invite link to my Discord server, which you're more than welcome to join. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new to the channel, and stick around for the next toaster adventure. Where the gang goes to Mars. No, I'm not making that up.